hire for potential. Don't hire for what you have done. And why I say that is nobody actually wanted to do things that they have done over and over again, but more on doing things a little bit different, a little bit harder every single time. Hire them now so that we can groom them to do the next thing that they might not have thought about. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Au, venture capitalist, Sarah founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. HD Mall is a healthcare marketplace in Southeast Asia, connecting patients to over 1,800 medical providers. This covers multiple categories, such as dental, aesthetics, and elective surgeries. Over 300,000 patients have accessed more affordable healthcare via HD Mall. Get yourself a well-deserved health checkup. If you're in Thailand, go to hdmall.co.th. If you're in Indonesia, go to hdmall.id. Hey, Tracy, really excited to have you on the show. I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for inviting me to this show, Jeremy. So my name is Tracy. I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of Fluid, which is flexible financing for B2B purchases. And I am also a mother of three young kids. And prior to building Fluid full-time, which is February 2023, I was a regional general manager of Atomi, the leading buy now pay later company across different markets in Asia. So how did you first get into technology? Wow. Uh, that was back in 2015. After I graduated from my MBA in Hong Kong, I wanted to have a change after my MBA to really get into a different industry because my background is actually hospitality. I'm originally from Macau. After my graduation, I just worked in like hotel industry. So it was super, I, I would say like a very different background versus a lot of other uh, entrepreneurs. So after my MBA, I decided to make a change and that's how I got a role at Uber as a GM of Macau. What was the experience at Uber like? I mean, those were the early days and very busy. So could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. I, I think jo joining Uber is really a life-changing experience. And if you talk to any ex-Uber, they would probably tell you the same. It's it's really an experience where it's, it's hard to replicate. And why I really love my experience there. It's because I, I really see a few good things uh, at Uber. Number one is it's a very mission-driven organization. So when you go to work, you will feel that everybody is actually driving towards the same mission, which is to make transportation as reliable as running water. I still remember that vision. And even though it is really difficult at that time, 2015, 2014, when taxi was still having... It's still having a lot of powers in a lot of countries. It, it was tough. You will see police coming to the office, asking us questions. But, but then the next day, like the team would just come back to work and say, hey, you know, let's fight for this mission again. So that really changes my thought about how to actually run a company. It's how do we actually get the talents that uh, are so aligned with the mission to really drive that mission forward. And I still remember when I was eight months pregnant and I was doing a campaign for Macau, which is to fight with the government to legalize ride sharing. I gather like tens of thousands of letters from different residents and march to the, the government office to really deliver the letters together with our driver partners. So that doesn't happen lightly, but that is a mission that I see that everybody is trying to work towards. So that's number one. I think the other thing that I really like about Uber and, and really as a GM is an organization where we make decisions with numbers. So every morning, everyone would go to work. And the first thing that we would do is really to open what we call is like heaven, where you see your numbers very clearly. You will see your supplies, whether you have enough drivers, you have enough vehicles on the road to meet the demand. And you would see different cars in different areas on the map. And that's the first thing you do, even when you're like fighting your egg sandwich, drinking your coffee. But that's the first thing that you need to do. So I think that also changes or maybe instill the importance of making decisions with numbers in my career after. And I, I would say as a GM there, you have a lot of autonomy. You are the one that 
driving the decisions for your country. So that really gives people a lot of power and the sense of impact and belonging in the organization. Amazing. So what's interesting is that, you know, you were a GM and you were having your first child during the entire experience. Could you share a little bit more about what that was like? Yeah, w women are actually stronger than what we thought. I still remember I had my last conference call while my water broke. <laughs> Whoa. You know, during the conference call. And I, re I still remember my operation manager, who is a male, was like, Ew, let's go to the hospital. Go rush there now. But that was quite interesting. But women are really stronger than what we thought. And we could really do whatever it takes and, and work harder towards a mission that you believe in. So I would say it's not as hard as what we thought, as long as we really love what we do and really believe that we are making an impact. But of course, you know, the organization also gave a lot of support, flexible working hours, which I, I believe is super important for women to be successful, especially even after giving birth, you have to breastfeed. And uh, also the, the team is super open about breastfeeding, pumping during meetings, which as long as you don't mind, which I, I don't, I think that is an understanding that we need to have for women to be successful in the workplace. And I still remember since I was actually the only female GM at Uber in APAC at that time, and also I was the only married one with a child, raising children is kind of like a foreign concept to a lot of male GM at that time. But they gained the understanding and that I, I think it's understanding that as a female leader that you can actually share with some of your male coworkers. Could you share a little bit more about your reflections on what it takes to be an effective GM? Because you, you know, you were a GM twice, right? Once at Uber and once at Otomi. So what are your thoughts about what makes an effective GM? Yeah, so number one, I, I think that's always what I say to the team is set stretch goal and unleash your potential. I think how we actually make the team grow together is to make sure that everyone is doing something that they're passionate about, but really set a goal that they feel is impossible or close to impossible to reach but as a leader to give them everything that we can to support them to reach that goal and once they reach that goal they would feel so good about themselves they would feel that they have grown a lot in the role so i think that that is super important when building teams and really putting people in the right spot in area that they love doing but really give them stretch tasks that they feel so good about after they have accomplished it. I think that's really important as a leader is how do you actually support your team to reach the potential that they didn't think that they could do. I think that's definitely number one. And I would say number two is to hire for potential. Don't hire for what you have done. And why I say that is nobody actually wanted to do things that they have done over and over again, but more on doing things a little bit different, a little bit harder every single time. So we always look for people that have potential to take the next step, but hire them now so that we can groom them to do the next thing that that they think they might not have thought about. So as a leader, it's very important for us to really identify the passionate potential in that candidate or in that team member and put them in the right role. So I think that's the second thing. And I would say the third thing is autonomy. I like to stress that we need to build a very flat organization where everybody's ideas are heard and everybody's voice is heard. Maybe they're at the very front or maybe like a lower level that actually are very close to the customers where as leader, we always have to hear from our employees, from our customer perspective, what they think of how to change your product, how to actually improve the organization. So I do believe that having a flatter structure, open communications, letting everybody speak their mind is super important as a leader. How do you think that GMs are measured from your perspective? Wow, that's a very good question. So there are a few things that I, I, I think are important. Number one, of course, is the commercial metrics like whether you're driving your GME, your revenue, whether you're making money, your economics, you know, all that. Second would be uh, the satisfaction of your team, whether you're able to retain talents, whether you're able to attract talents, and that can be measured with some of the metrics like retention or the quality of work from your team. And I think number three is really about measuring the GM with the big picture and long-term thinking. I, I see a lot of great GMs that are more focusing on the current, but not really making decisions for the future of the company. So I think not, not just reaching the commercial goals in the shorter term, but thinking about what's next. What is the path to get to the mission? What is the path to actually really drive to the vision of the company that requires measure in every single GM of the country? What's interesting is that, you know, there's lots of companies that have GMs and they also have market launching, right? 
which is an activity, but also a separate role. Previously, we had a guest called Ashwin. He came on to share about his experience being a market launcher for Lime and other kind of companies across the region. Could you share a little bit more about that? Because, you know, that's a different phase, right? In the market entry and as a GM, you know, so how do you think about that? I love the idea of market launcher. And that's also a program that I have launched together with my uh, boss at Atomi, who, who was the CEO of Atomi. Why I love about that was because when I was a GM at Uber, the market launcher actually shared a lot of playbook from the other countries for me so that I was able to actually take those playbooks and localize that for my country. And there are tons of good learnings at Uber from the other countries as well. So there's no reason for any new GM to reinvent the wheel. And at Uber, one, one thing that they did very well was there's like a central location where you can see, oh, you know, this country run this campaign and this is how it's measured. And so everybody can actually read about those great campaigns and localize that for the country and even actually invite the person in charge of that campaign or in certain countries to come over. So I think that actually accelerates the growth of every single GM in the other countries with the market launcher. And also, it also takes a different DNA of a market launcher versus a GM, whereas the market launcher usually like to move around. They, they love to share the knowledge, but at the end, they need to find someone local that understands the local nuances to really move the country forward to the next stage. So I, I do really like that setup. So that's why at the Toby, when we're launching the different countries and there are a couple of members in the regional team to help the GM or even to hire the GM to make sure that we can have a local person to be in charge of the country to make it successful. So I, I really love idea and that really accelerates the growth. Is there a transition point from a market launch towards more of a GM mentality or is it more of like a spectrum? I would say I was I would say that at least at Uber, the market launcher is a different person so that it is more like the market launcher kind of transfer all the knowledge and playbooks that he knows to the GM and then he would pretty much go to the next country. And that's how Uber was able to actually launch, I think, like hundreds of countries within a very short time. So as a GM, basically, when you're hired, you're already thinking how to actually make this country grow faster or hit the next milestone. So I would say the mentality of a GM is it's to be owning the country everything in every single aspect, P&L, people, hiring, culture, whereas the launch is pretty much it accelerates the growth of the GM to be successful in that role. You've been a GM at one, you know, like you said, a travel and transportation company and the second being, you know, a fintech company. So any differences from your perspective? Yeah, definitely a lot. So when I joined Uber was 2015, it was relatively big in the US already and APAC was just starting where I could learn a lot from the other country GMs and everybody's super smart. Whereas when I joined Atomi, I was the first GM. And when I joined, we actually just had a product. So it was at a very different stage. I still remember we were doing like $3,000 GMV per month when I joined. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, so when I left, it was like nine digit US dollars GMV per month. So it's actually grown really fast. And it's the real scaling a product from zero to one. But I do think that even at Uber versus at FinTech, which is the the buy now, pay later. The, the difference is, is that uh, I had to actually learn a lot about finance. I had to learn a lot about how different financial product works and also banking partnerships and all that. But there are actually surprisingly a lot of similarities. So how to actually grow the business are very similar. Some of the strategies we could actually use for Uber uh, versus Atomi because for Uber, like when I was running Uber Eats, I actually run both Uber Eats and Uber Rides. Uber Eats is like a three-dimensional marketplaces, whereas Atomi is the same. Like we have merchants, we have our product, we have our users. Same for Uber Eats, like uh, there's restaurants, the eaters and the product. So scaling that marketplace, uh, what we call, you know, it's a marketplace is relatively similar in our strategy. So I would say that the knowledge is something that I need to learn from a financial industrial perspective, but growing the business that the perspective about growing the business are, are quite similar. So what's interesting is that since then you've decided to build your own company. Could you share a little bit more about why you decided to found Fluid? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a it's an area that has a lot of potential that we can unlock. So how I got this idea was when I was working at Tomi, there are merchants asking, hey, can you actually do an installment for our business customers? So just, just for everybody, then Fluid is actually a you, you can call it like B2B, buy now, pay later. But we do more than that. We flexible financing for B2B purchases where the buy
buy us can pay now and they can also pay with credit terms. We only focus on B2B uh, marketplaces and suppliers. And we have like checkout that can be integrated with a website. We also can be integrated with marketplaces or even traditional supply invoicing systems, whereas the suppliers or the suppliers would get paid pretty much immediately after the goods are delivered. So our unique selling point is that a suppliers give us a fee and they don't have to worry about accounts receivables collection and they don't have to talk to lenders for lending money to borrow, to borrow money to actually give credit terms to their buyers. So with our end-to-end solutions, they can pretty much grow the business without thinking about accounts receivable or getting loan from a third party. So that's a concept. But why I got that idea was like, go back to the reason was when I was at Atomi, the merchants are asking, whether we could have the installment plan for the B2B customers. Then I started thinking, oh, okay, maybe there's like a good opportunity and started to talk to potential customers and realize that there are also similar startups in the US and Europe that raise a bunch of money and doing quite well. And that's why I decided to take a leap of faith to do something by myself. But of course, that also has a bit related to like timing and my co-founder. At the same time, my co-founder who used to be the head of product in Tomi in the very early stage, he even joined earlier than I did and also head of fintech product in Kupang in Korea. Kim reached out to me and said, hey, Tracy, you want to do something together? So I'm like, oh, okay, great. I have a good co-founder. I have a good idea. And I believe that's the right time for me to start my own company. So I took a leap of faith. Amazing. So you took a leap of faith. And what's the difference between being a GM versus being a founder from your perspective? Oh, growing the business pretty much is the same. But I think the only area that I feel very unsure, really didn't know about is fundraising. So being a founder, I had to not just thinking about how to grow the business, how to build a team, which was the role of a GM, but how to make the company survive, how to have enough money to keep the ball rolling. And that actually took up significant of my time to network with VCs, network with founders, make sure that we have a plan to have sufficient capital to grow our business. I think that's the part that I had to learn from scratch. And the other thing is, as a founder, you tend to, or at least myself, tend to worry a lot more at the beginning. You would be like, oh, what if I fail? What if the team members I hired cannot make it? What if we cannot make it? And we kind of fail the team members that believe in us. You know, I think that sense of responsibility was quite strong at the beginning. But of course, after two months, I decided not to think about that and just focus on building a business and getting the money in. What advice would you give to founders who are preparing to fundraise, especially for first-time founders? I made so many mistakes along the way. I, I would say that the strategy of fundraising is to get all the VCs to say yes or no at the same time. So you can actually have your leverage in negotiation. So actually, we we had fundraised twice. Number one, that the first time was back in March, like early March 2023, when we first started. And I, the first mistake that I made was I didn't really prepare a very nice stack. I was just like, oh, this is what we're going to do. And let, let's actually put a few slides together and let's talk to Sequoia. Sequoia reached out because like I changed my, you know, my position to founder and somebody reached out to me and said, hey, let's talk. Put, like, your background is interesting. So without even thinking of preparing my pitch, we spoke to Sequoia. And of course, that was a failure because they asked a lot of questions that we didn't think about and I didn't know how to answer. So number one is really prepare very well and rehearse with uh, experienced VC like Jeremy or like founders that are experienced in, in fundraising to give you advice of how to actually make the pitch better. And then the second thing is this, the timing is to think about which how long does this VC actually take time to make the decision versus some other, some VCs are very fast. Some VCs took a little bit longer time. So how do you actually time it in a way where you can make a number or more than like maybe five or 10 VCs to say yes or no at the same time? I think that needs a little bit of strategic thinking. So number one is really a lot of preparation. Number two is to time, is to make the timing of the VC's discussion strategically. So those would be my two pieces of advice based on my mistakes that I've made. Well, I, I myself as a first-time founder also made those mistakes as well. So, you know, I think it's a function of the fact that as founders, we are yet to work first and build first. And it's a different activity motion for the fundraising side as well. Yeah. Looking forward, you know, can you share a little bit more about some of the dynamics of Fluid and how the business works? Yeah, definitely. So our mission is really to simplify B2B payments. So at a tap of a button, your B2B purchases will be financed. So what we really wanted to do is to help the 
suppliers and buyers to get financing easier and not, not just financing, but also pay now. So I, I think now we, I would like to say that we are at a stage where we see early product market fit and we are scaling our business with the first version of our product. And so I really look forward to 2024 with some of the VCs that really believe in us and investing in us and of course, angel investors as well. So looking at 2024, we really wanted to use this product to scale the market and also identify a few industries that we would really like to be a leader in. So that would be the goal of 2024. There's a lot of lending in Southeast Asia. You mentioned Otomi, which is buy now, pay later on the consumer credit side. There's also the B2B on the lending side. How should founders and operators think about building a lending business in Southeast Asia? Well, that's a very, very, very good question. A caveat is I am still learning. Definitely there are a new knowledge that I gain every day running this business. But at least from my experience with Matomi, running a successful lending business really have two fronts. Number one is raising sufficient debt facility to really scale the business. When I was at Atomi, one of the competitor strategy, or at least when we see why some of the competitors are not doing as well as they were actually they were not able to secure the debt facility and debt funding to scale the business. So when they actually go and talk to merchants, they might not be able to support the books that they have currently. So that really at the Tomi, they had a really experienced team of finance leadership that is experienced with raising that capital and also have strong partnership with banks. So that really enabled the growth of the business. So number one is really get the debt facility, plan early, build that relationship early, and really need to get the debt locally to ensure that we have the best cost of funding and also not having the exchange currency risk. So that's number one. And of course, the second thing is risk. Managing the risk is super important in the lending business and how do we actually build a robust model? What kind of data that are unique to your model that the other lenders don't have? I think that that really enables us to maintain the par 30, par 60, or, and also the default rate at, at a manageable level so that we are able to continue to get that facility, continue to get these bank partnerships and further scale the growth. So I do believe that those two are super important in the lending business. Any myths or misconceptions that you think exist about building a fintech company in Southeast Asia? Oh, I think maybe I can share a little bit about the context of, of Fluid when we first started fundraising. And we started fundraising at the funding winter and also right after the consumer BMPL saying, hey, the economics was hard and like the valuation of partner like really fell quite significantly. So common things I heard from the VC is that, oh, now you're building a similar product, but in the B2B space, how they would actually compare us with like a consumer side. But when we're thinking about the B2B space, it's really solving a completely different problem where we are you're thinking about us as like a more like a trade financing product than like a consumer lending product. So that I think that's is the number one misconception that some of the VCs have or, or other people have when we're speaking to them. So when we're looking at Fluid versus consumer BNPL, why we're solving a different problem is every single time when you trade, when you buy product as a business to grow your, your business, you, you know, to offer your service to the customers, you really need credit terms. And when we're looking at numbers, over 70% of the consumer, of the merchants, of the business actually need credit terms to run the business. So that is an essential part of the equation to make the business successful. So I think the misconception is always to compare us with consumer BMPL side where, where mm. we're actually solving a different problem. And, and going back to your question about fintech, I would say like fintech, I, I think at least for my conversations with the VCs, is still an area that we do believe in and, and a lot of VCs believe in. And we have seen successful fintech company quite a lot actually in Asia, for example, like Aspire or like Neom, you know, those, those are really successful tech and a lot of VCs still have a strong hope in this area and how we can make it successful. Looking ahead, what do you think are important aspects? Because you've done the market entry side, you've done the fintech side, you've done the lending side. Do lending businesses scale well across different geographies? It really depends on how you build a risk model. So that's why we are very intentional when building a risk model in one country versus the other is to make is to making sure what aspects can be scalable across different markets. So even at Atomi, I think the sources of information could be different, but how the model works could be very similar. So that is the part that we focus on scalability, whereas the sources of information would be different across different countries. So I think that's definitely the area that we could scale. But when you're looking at, of course, managing risk, 
across different markets in Asia are very different. For example, in emerging markets, we have to pay a lot more attention to fraud, whereas in developed market, probably the attention to fraud could be slightly less. So those are the nuances that we look at when we go to different markets. Could you share about a time that you personally have been brave? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking that. Definitely is really to start uh, a startup during the funding winter when everybody, VC, founders, friends, family, asked me not to do it. But I do actually see a lot of benefits in starting startup in a funding winter. And number one, is there a lot of talent. I found that it's a lot easier to hire great talents now versus when everybody is actually building a company. And now we have, unfortunately, layoffs across different really great tech companies around the world. And these talents are actually looking to do the best next thing. And how do we actually attract them to the company? It's super important, but that actually also positions us in the, the current situation, position us in a better uh, in a better time to actually attract these talents to join startups. I think that's number one. The other thing is a lot of great startups are, bo uh, are born out of the winter season. And that actually makes the founders a lot more cautious or, or discipline in using the fund and really make cautious decision of what we are actually taking next. So I do think that there are a lot of good things coming out from this funding winter. And I do believe that the next unicorn or like next Amazon will be actually coming out of this this time. I'll say another thing that we've discussed before that has been brave is that you've chosen to become a mother of three kids while also being a founder oh, yeah. as well. So I'm kind of curious about how that is going. Yeah, it's really great, actually. I'm not even joking here. I, I know it sounds difficult, but it's been actually really great. There are actually, a, I would say, a number of reasons why or how we make it work. Number one, I think as a female entrepreneur, you need to pick the right partner in the household. So you need to have a very supportive husband to really make it work. So, so for my case, when I was working for a company, my husband was running his own startup or his own company. And now he's not. So I feel like we kind of switch role and then he is in a more, I would say, a more stable role where he was able to spend more time with the family, with the kids. Our kids are like age three, five and seven, still very young. But we were actually able to switch role in different stages of our life. And I think that's super important for any female founder to plan the career is to plan together with your partner. And I, I do think that it's, it's, it will be a very difficult situation when both partners, the couples are actually running their own business or having a very demanding job. And that would not be very good for the well-being of the children. So picking the right partner would be important in building your business. And also, I think the timing would be quite important. I think the second reason why I think it's great is because my kids are now three, five, seven, and Singapore has very good education system where the kids can go to school for the whole day after they turn three, four, especially. So the demand of a mother is, I would say, different. It's not like we have to still breastfeed and, and which I was intentional of starting the business while all the kids are coming out of diaper and not breastfeeding. And also when my husband has a bit more stable role. So I think those kind of support system are super important to be in place before starting a business as a female founder, especially as a mother. I think you know, it's not just for women, but also for men, right? I think a lot of them are pretty scared about setting up families because they know they are founders. Like, you know, so much busy, you can't focus on your family or it's going to take you away from your work. Any words of advice for people who are, you know, kind of deciding whether to set up a family or not or whether to be a founder or not in the context of setting up a family? I would say my piece of advice to, or at least from my experience, is don't start it too late. I do think that a lot of, you know, some of my friends are thinking about it and then like, then it could be too late to have children, especially for women. I do believe that we are really stronger than what we think we are. And as long as we are disciplined with our time, good with our time management, I do believe that we will be able to do both. You know, having the great support system at home, choosing the right partners. So I would say looking at my career, after my MBA, I switched to a tech industry. And then I was also quite intentional in looking for a, a partner to build a family. And because I know that I was late 20s. Actually, like if you're looking at the time right now, is I, I also started out a little bit earlier having children. But I, I love the timing because now my kids have grown up and it's my time to shine. You know, uh, I have a family, I have, a, I have kids, but at the same time, I'm building my own startup. So I, I think that when the kids are at a certain age, they can go to school by themselves. And that's really the best time to do it. But I think for, for men, you guys are a little bit more flexible because the women are the one that 
have to do the duties. Sometimes that the men unfortunately cannot help. But it, I do think that having a family make you more disciplined and also plan ahead in terms of your career and how to really work together as a team to make this really successful. Thank you so much for sharing. On that note, I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from the conversation. First sure. of all, thank you so much for sharing about what's it like to be a GM at both Uber and Atomi. It was fascinating to hear about your advice about how to be successful at a job, how the job should be measured, and also what are the key dimensions of market launching versus being responsible for the country versus how to hire for the country team. So a really fascinating set of experiences and advice there. Secondly, thank you so much for sharing about Fluid and what you're thinking in terms of fintech and what's it like to build a fintech startup during a funding winter. And also a lot of your experiences about what you think are the myths and misconceptions about lending, risk management, and also your own personal advice of how fintech startups should go about fundraising and learn what they need to learn to be strategic in their approach. Lastly, thanks for sharing about your entire time as a personal journey, both as a, like you said, a GM who had their water break during the conference call, all the way to becoming a mother of three kids, but also choosing to be a founder as well. So thank you for that very honest conversation. I love how you said that women are stronger than they think. And I think there's some very good and personal advice about how to be thoughtful about both family planning, as well as career planning, as well as choosing to build a new startup. On that note, thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing your experience. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me over, Jeremy. Really great sharing some of the experience that I had and hope it's useful for some of the people that are thinking to start a company. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave.